Okay. Have you noticed? You're actually getting closer to me. <laughs> <laughs> no, it is a bit, because I feel like I'm turning my back on whoever's in that scene. Well, that's alright. A lot of and people are doing that this then week. Then when you're talking, I don't know what these two are doing. Oh. Well, we'll, um, we'll, just, we'll just... It's a face of disdain. <laughs> <laughs> Most people are that. Most people are that. You're getting closer. That's it. I'll be next to you now. Okay. Once you go over here, that's it. It's not good news. With Bale not being sent off, Suarez scoring a goal, which was not offside, but was ruled to be. Suarez's foul on Varane, leading to Messi's goal, and Marcelo's pen not given. Which of the two sides in El Clasico do you think got more decisions <laughs> against them? <laughs> Fair point. Bing bong! <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Let's assume that Gareth Bale gets sent off, right? Yep. All right. Well, that, that changes the dynamic of the game right there. So all the other things that happen wouldn't have happened. Right. So, that's where I ended. Well, let's go through the instance. Yes. Well, I think they just did. <laughs> yeah, they did. <laughs> <laughs> Chronologically, Bale was kind of the first one, wasn't it? Right. On the strike at half-time. Yeah. Then that, that would have been the red card. Right. Then, obviously, you had the Suarez on Varane. It would have never been 2-1. Right. Right. Then you take it, take it uh, up the other end now. We have Marcelo's penalty at 2-2. Yep. Yeah. So. Are you keeping score? Yeah, I saw my else is missing. What am I missing? Well, you could say Ramos, should he got it sent off for that chance on the halfway line? It's 2-2. Yeah. I saw him else, because we saw it in the clip. Oh, I don't think so. Sure. Yeah. <laughs> Good. 2-2 two, two, then. <laughs> All right, right, 2-2. Two, two. Final fair. score. There's a lot to talk about. Every, everyone's happy. Uh, City absolutely dominated the Premier League this season by playing fantastic football, but still got knocked out in the Champions League quarterfinals. What is needed to finally be a Champions League powerhouse? Well, I think they have everything to be a Champions League powerhouse. There's just the problem when you get to the quarterfinals, you have great teams. And any time it's just over two legs, you have to perform, right? And they get knocked out by an English team. So right. It's not like... It's not like they were taken apart by Roma, uh, Juventus, <laughs> or uh, or even like Bayern, Bayern Munich, Munich or, or, like, yeah. So, uh, or, yeah, or a Barcelona or somebody. Yeah, which to some degree, I, and I think Stevie might have said something along these lines, is that he would have wished it would have been uh, a non-English team that Liverpool had played against, and I think Manchester City would have felt the same way. Yeah. A team that that is not so familiar with them and uh, a team that would sort of be guessing as to what they're going to do on the field and wouldn't be so comfortable playing against a team that they were already beaten that year. So, Roma? What about Roma? They like me in Roma, let me tell you. I am you popular. The, you're the only one that it's popular. You're the only one that keeps going back there. I know. Yeah. I like it. You keep going back to the, to, to, the, to the pond and you throw in your, your bait again. <laughs> <laughs> what does Ali make of Zlatan's oh. post-match comments? What did he say? Calling out his teammates to wake up. Well, that didn't take long. Yeah, anyway, it's, it's predictable. It's predictable that this was going to happen. Look, Zlatan Ibrahimovic has been calling out his teammates in every club that he's... Should have got sent off after, what, 10 minutes? Yes, and the weekend, yes, though? yes. And he's been calling out his teammates in every team that he's been a part of. And so, that he does this here... Uh, with the LA Galaxy, a team that lacks balance. Uh, yes, they're very exciting going forward, but back there they have no idea what they're doing defensively. And in the end, every, all this honeymoon of Slatan is so great, he's so yeah. beautiful, everything is wonderful, great yeah. goals and this and that, all of that is going to be over at some point and you're going to end up seeing what the results are. Well, they have to improve those results and uh, I'm not surprised that he's, he's getting frustrated and he won't be the end of this until they start winning some games. Who asked him the question, was it last week? I had to come. Had, someone, somebody just had to ask him. <laughs> well, I, I saw an interview right. that popped up where somebody was asking him what it was either what was no it wasn't what was better the difference between MLS and the Premier League. Right? Mm. Did you see that? <laughs> well, no, I did not. It popped up. Right? They like oh, that question, don't they? Yeah. And he gave this long. I, I'm sure to get because I didn't. I didn't. I didn't click. No. I didn't because I thought you, I can't. No clickbait. No, because I just thought. Stop asking. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Casey, really, people, it, it's the insecurity of, oh, why do you keep having to ask? It's because it's such a stupid question. Well, somebody asked me the same thing the other day, and I said about $200 million a year in budget. There you go. I Same. mean, it's a pretty oh, simple... Yeah. That, and, that and the fact that MLS is 1996. Yeah. 
you guys oh, play yeah. for clubs that I'm, were over 100 I, I, years old. So I, yeah, I was speaking at a conference and, and somebody. Ooh. Oh, hello. <laughs> <laughs> It was for oh, ESPN. Like, that's the <laughs> what was that? It was, and and it really was a question because it was an analytics conference. Was it PowerPoint? Yes, it was PowerPoint. No, analytics no. conference. This is right up the street. Well, which is which is not my street either. So so I said, look, you guys expect to goals, but I said you guys are used to numbers. I'll give you some numbers when you're talking about that difference. You know, some of the clubs I played for. You know, Fulham was founded like 1885. Yeah. 1884. You know, Spurs, like 1885, you know, uh, Millwall, 1886, you know. The, yeah, How long it, did you go on for the conference naming these? Well, let me say, <laughs> look, there's a long history that we're fighting up against with these teams that have been in existence for 130, 140 years to 1996. And that's just the originals. Yep. You know, Sounders, 2009, yep. you know, Atlanta, you know, a couple years old. Yeah, it's... It's impossible to make that that comparison. Yeah, it's, right. it's, a, it's, a, it's the fact that somebody's asking that question. Right. This is stupid. Okay. Right. <laughs> Any other numbers? Analytics, you see. <laughs> analytics. analytics <laughs> <conference>. Love <laughs> a bit of analytics. Uh, if going to see back tomorrow. I think we'll be talking uh, relegation. Just a reminder now, we are with you seven days a week, what? ladies and gentlemen. What happened to the days off? No more days off. What? Like a bad smell, you can't get rid of us. You could slant it that the top four race got a bit more interesting this weekend with Chelsea beating Liverpool at Stamford Bridge by one goal to nil. It still leaves Conte's side with a little bit of hope of qualifying for the top four. It's all really about Liverpool. If they beat Brighton, then it's fine. They are done and dusted. They have qualified for the Champions League once again. If they don't and Chelsea beat Huddersfield and then win away against Newcastle, then it would be Chelsea who will be in the Champions League, not Liverpool. Spurs obviously are in that equation as well, but they should... They should be fine. I think Newcastle and Leicester, they should be able to get enough points. Well, Although, we thought when they went to West Brom, they'd win that game easily. Yeah, but West Brom were fighting for something. They've got a, got a caretaker manager in there that's, that's got the players yep. up for a fight, and, and they scrapped. The teams they've got to play. Yeah. <laughs> Leicester in particular. Leicester oh. have done well, Newcastle the well, same. Well, well, don't, don't just pick on Leicester. Newcastle Leicester have, have, Leicester have gone completely down tools well. on Claude Puel, who looks as <laughs> if yeah. he might now get fired. <laughs> yes. uh, and look, Klopp does look a bit tetchy. I know he's in the Champions League final, yeah. but he looks a little, he looks a little tense at the moment. And I don't think it's, I think it's partly because of the top four. Uh, but I think they've only got to beat Brighton. But I think it's injuries. Yeah. It's the, the story with the coach leaving. So from that sense, it's not ideal. But Brighton at home. Yeah. You're safe. Yeah. You win. That's it done because your goal difference is huge yeah. compared to Chelsea's. Is there a race? A slight race, yeah. Yeah. just simply based on the fact that, yes, it should be Liverpool, right? They should be Brighton, but they should have been Stoke at home. And they should have taken care of West Brom away. And then we were concerned about drive fields and so on <laughs> and so forth. And so there's been storylines here that should have made this a whole lot easier for Liverpool, and yet they're still in it. As it pertains to, to Spurs, I mean, they're playing Newcastle and, and Leicester. Yeah. It, it, it is the picture of a holiday that is going on in both clubs, so they should be okay. I think there is a race. But it depends on Liverpool, and you just said that. Sergio Ramos suggesting that Messi uh, was in the referee's ear at half-time, basically saying you need mm. to sort yourself out. And people are putting two and two together, and obviously he didn't really blow for anything in the, in the second half. And he was obviously intimidated by, by Messi. Well, this is, this is what Ramos implied. I mean, Ramos was kind of cautious about what he said, but at the same time, not cautious. He said, well, yes, we saw some things at halftime and they were saying all sorts of things to the referee. And, and he said, and I don't know what was said and I'm not interested in what happens off the pitch and I'd much rather talk about what was on the pitch. But then you wonder, don't you, if in the second half, this is Ramos talking still, you wonder if in the second half, maybe because of that pressure, he starts to change the way he's blowing. Um, so obviously the, the implication from Ralph very, very, very strongly there is that, is that even if it's subconscious, the referee has that kind of compensation idea going on in, in his head after the sending off of, of Sergio Roberto. I would like to believe that it's, that it's not that. It's simply that for whatever reason, he just hasn't seen these, these two really quite clear um, well, one's a penalty and one's a foul. Uh, I think Valverde said uh, after the game, if there was VAR, they would still be playing because obviously <laughs> there were so many instances. But it, if VAR was, was implemented, it would have sorted everything out, wouldn't it? It's Monday. It, it is. It, Come on. it, it well, I, I, you, you, would, you would presume so. Yeah. You would. It, it, it would have surely caught the Suarez foul. 
Well, and the bail <laughs> fell. And, and the, the bail fell. Yes. <laughs> and the penalty. <laughs> yes. And yeah. maybe the Ramos second. Yeah. yeah, you would think so, but listen, there's not. We, this VAR thing is destroying us at the moment, isn't it? Because <laughs> yeah. Some of them want it, some of them don't, some managers want some... I, I yeah. don't know. The yeah. referees have been abysmal, not just yeah. in Spain, I, by I, the, but the referees in England have been terrible. The too. easy part about it was the game didn't matter. Yeah. It's 2-2, two -two, yeah. and it was, everybody can lie. Oh, yeah, it was a foul, it wasn't. And, yeah. and that, that's the part where if, if this that? mattered and either of these teams needed three points to win the title, yeah. then it would have been a different oh, what's conversation. What's classical without a little controversy Correct. here and there? A little, a little salt and pepper. Oh, so, so the referee held it, really. Uh, there you go. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's some spice yeah, for yeah. Barcelona, of course. Three more games to go. If they don't lose any of them, the first team ever to go a whole season undefeated in the history of La Liga. Let's stick with uh, Bale, shall we, Sid? You take a look at it. Of course, hasn't started in any of the real big Champions League matches over the last three months. It looks like his time is almost up at Madrid. How defining could that performance be in the camp now to his future? Or is it, it doesn't matter. He can score a hat-trick and he still won't be starting Champions League final. Well, of course, the suspicion is that it doesn't matter. The suspicion is that this has now reached a point of no return. And certainly, I think some of the, the, the way in which Zidane has managed this, the fact that really and truly Zidane and, and Gareth Bale aren't talking a huge amount, it's not like Zidane has given Bale an explanation and said, this is why you're not playing because of this, this and this. So Bale's in this kind of in this sort of strange uh, kind of grey zone now where he doesn't really know what's going on. But, of course, he doesn't need to be told because each week when there's a big game, he's not put in the side. This is a situation that, of course, will come to a head at the end of the season, but there isn't any point and there isn't any real value in speaking up before then. Mm. But as you say, of course, there is still that Champions League final at the end of it. Now, of course, I suspect that what Gareth Bale um, will be thinking now is that in the best-case scenario he gets the chance to come on in the Champions League final and make a decisive impact in the final. But I don't think he starts. Now, he got the chance to start in this game with the absence of Isco through, through injury. Perhaps it's a slight surprise that he got the nod ahead of Asensio or Lucas Bathka, given that they've played ahead of him recently. And yeah, maybe he did give himself the chance to at least remind Zidane that he can play, remind Zidane that he can be useful. But right now, I still think he doesn't start the Champions League final. What he has done, I think, is give himself the opportunity to come oh, no, on. No, he doesn't start the final. No, doesn't no, no, doesn't matter. No, not 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 by the odd goal or two, but that would if what said saying is correct, and I'm sure I'm sure it is. That if there's a disconnect between the player and the manager, if it's coming from the manager's side, that would be strange to me because, or, or it would either tell me that he doesn't want him at the club right. next season. But I would find that strange to, to sort of ostracise somebody in terms of not talking to them, because I would have thought. With someone like Bale, even if he's not... Would you like Gareth Bale coming off the bench? Mm. As long as he was happy? Mm. I mean, what a great impact player that is to have. But, but enable you to do that. You've got to sort of cuddle him and cajole yeah, him in that period to make him believe that next year... You right. will play a little bit more next year, even though I know I'm going to put you on the bench. Uh, but then I'm going to be able to use you as a substitute. A bit like it happened at Chelsea with, uh, with Fabregas for a long time and, 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 and Conte's first season. But you've got to convince the player that he's going to play a major part. Now, if they're not talking at all, the player will just say, right, I'm off. Yeah, or, I never took you for a cuddler, by the way. Right. No, no, but, no, but, no, or, no. or it has to be the conversation, look, you're going to get your times and look, we'll, we'll yeah. work with you yeah. to find a club to move you on. Because in my understanding, he's got three years left on his contract. You know, it You've got seems, to have a conversation, haven't well, you? Exactly. I mean, it's a, similar to a point with what they did with David Beckham when they completely froze him out, but the difference was David was out of contract. Yeah. So he signs the pre-contract to go to L.A., then he works his way back into the team, and everyone's like, oh, we want you to stay, but it's too late. This is, when you've got three years left on, what I'm assuming is a pretty big contract. Yeah, of that, course. That, that yeah. They're going to go either... Well, they'll not be coming on here anytime right. soon. <laughs> either <laughs> either they've got to use him or they yet. have to sell him and clear that books and get him. Because he's not going to be happy <laughs> just being a bit part player for three more years. Reports in England suggesting it's a two-horse race regarding who will fill Arsene Wenger's shoes at Arsenal. Luis Enrique coming in at 2-1. to one. Max Allegri at 10-1, to one, according to the bookies. But reports suggesting it's between those two. Uh, Sid Lowe is still with us in Spain. Sid, obviously you followed Luis Enrique closely uh, during his time at Barcelona. How do you feel he would get on in the Premier League and at Arsenal in particular? Well, I mean, I think the thing to do when you talk about Luis Enrique is to look at him from the point of view of the way that he works and, and the personality rather than necessarily a specific style. Um, there was a huge amount of debate 
around the way that Barcelona played with him and whether this was kind of in line with the, the, the high, whole idea of philosophy. And up to a point, I think what happened was that the, the, the way that he was supposedly breaking from Barcelona's style was exaggerated, partly because of the fact that he didn't really talk to the media a huge amount because he didn't seem to be part of a kind of, if you like, a project of continuity. But I think really how you define Luis Enrique is, is the incredible intensity, the incredible competitiveness with which he played and with which he's managed. He will look at every detail. He will be very, very much on top of his players in terms of the work, but not really on top of them very much in terms of the, if you like, kind of the pastoral care. He's not a manager to, to, to look after players. He's not a manager to put his arm around players. He's not a manager to build particularly close relationships with them. But he will work extremely hard on the detail, on the intensity, and, on, and if you like, on the more the competitive side than the tactical side. But there will be a lot of tactical analysis as well. But it won't be following a philosophy necessarily. It will be following what he believes is pragmatic and necessary. In that sense, I think what Arsenal would be getting is an extremely hard-working manager, a manager who will be determined to understand and adapt to the Premier League, and who I think will have the capability to do that. Now, obviously... It's more difficult when you don't have some of the communication skills you need, although he spent this year, amongst many other things, trying to learn some English. Um, and, I, and I think that he's potentially uh, a good signing for Arsenal, but, but shouldn't, probably shouldn't be seen in terms of the continuation of an idea or a philosophy. So what one of those umpteen things that you brought up there did he not do at Roma? <laughs> well, did he not do at Roma? What you mean? Because well, things didn't go well. He, everything you, well... Correct. Yeah. Well, I mean, essentially, as we saw, of course, that part, part of what happened at Roma was that he had, um, in those first months, and obviously I say this as someone who covers Spanish football, not Italian football, but he had the difficulty of the relationship with Totti, who he wasn't playing. He didn't always have what's always known in Spain as, as left hand, the ability to kind of take a softly, softly approach to gently smooth things over. He has an idea and he goes with it very, very directly. Now, obviously, depending on the kind of dressing room you've got, depending on the kind of players you've got, that can be more or less problematic. And we saw in Spain, for example, that the relationship with, with Messi appeared to be quite near breaking point early on. But what happened is that Xavi Hernandez, amongst other players, intervened and kind of smoothed that over now. A lot will depend on how well he, he kind of settles within that Arsenal dressing room. But as I say, he's not a manager who will be trying particularly hard to be friends with his players. Mm. Cuddles? And we're back, all back to cuddles, Craig, again. <laughs> By the way, I look at that list and I'm like, Ugh. <laughs> it's, not, it's not uber exciting, is it? Well, let's be quite frank about it. That's one of the issues that Arsenal have got. That, that, and, trying to, and, that, and replacing Wenger, it's not... The best ones at the moment are all in jobs. Right. Mm. Kind of. I mean, I don't see Ancelotti going there mm. at all. Mm. What's coming out of Arsenal uh, seems to be leaking out is, is, and I think it would take a lot of them off the list, is they want to go for younger. Right. They, wanna, they don't see a manager coming in for a two- or three-year project mm. and then shipping off somewhere else. They think this is a long-term rebuild, restructuring behind the scenes as well with the directors of football and the coaches and the scouts, and all that is changing. They see a younger person that they hope is going to take them successfully through the next five or ten years. Not these managers that we see, that, like Mourinho, like Pep, I suppose, in some way, that go into to a, to, to a Bayern Munich or go into a Man City and spend a few years going to these clubs, get them up and running, get them successful and move on. I don't think that's what they're but looking for. Generally speaking, though, you don't want to be the guy after the legend. You want to be the guy that comes after the guy mm. so that the club has smooth things over, so that you actually have a direction. Because right now, if you're Luis Enriquez, let's say that he's the guy. Well, the first thing he's got to do is like he's got a clean house. Sure. Because then if, if, if he's going to be the guy and he's not going to cuddle these players, well, they've been cuddled for a while. Yeah. And so this cannot be the group of players that you're going to depend on in order to get results. And in order to get your players in and the, the guys that are going to follow what you're going to say is going to take some time. And so that transition period, who wants to be a part of that? Well, it's, it's not a bad time, though. They finish, they're going to finish, what, six? Yeah. The bar is set so low. Right. I mean, when Fergie went... Uh, he just won the league. He won the league. When, when Henke's left Bayern Munich, they'd won a treble. Yeah. What about what Allegri, case? He's, he, obviously, he's had so much success at Juventus. Yeah. Part of me thinks, why on earth would you want to leave? You well, know? And you're, you're the marquee team in a league. I mean, Pep has gone in going from Barcelona to Bayern Munich to, to as much money as he wanted at Man City. Allegri's going to go from the team that ran everything yeah. to a team that he's got to rebuild. 
and not have the resources that five other clubs have. Which is why I think when managers talk to the Arsenal board about the budget to compete with United and City and maybe even Liverpool, it'll be a younger person right. who they can control a little bit more.